Good evening, everyone. We're going to call to order the Thursday, May 16th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Uh, can we please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions or deletions to this evening's agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. Uh, additional materials? Staff received two emails and six letters after publication of the agenda packet. All materials were distributed to the city council and are available for public review in our hard copy packet and online. Thank you. We'll move now to item four, oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda or items that are on our consent agenda. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Please state your name clearly if you would like it recorded in the minutes. Hi, welcome. Um, my concern, as before, are the uh, extraordinary uh, organizations you belong to. One is AMBAG, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. It's a cog, and any time anybody votes there, uh, they're spending also federal and state money, and that the person attending those meetings do not have in writing a clear... Uh, okay from the rest of the council for what they're voting on there and the public does not know about it nor do any of the local schools um, there's a article that I, that's included in the packet i gave you from uh, willie brown um, he, he advocated getting rid of 58 counties and 445 cities replaced by a few regional agencies i've got the fabian socialist books 1942 which became part of of the Americans for Democratic Action, which is a huge part of the Democratic Party. Also, Leon Panetta, who gave military and policy information to a communist spy called Hugh de Lacey, uh, red Chinese uh, spy, by the way, um, has a huge, the biggest lobby west of the Mississippi, and that's California Forward. His co-chairman is Lenny Mendonca, Committee for Economic Development, they advocate getting rid of 80% of the governments. So your very jobs, by belonging to these organizations, nobody's ever talked. I bet you can't find a person on the street that ever heard of uh, CalCog. And uh, you, you don't have it on your budget, so you must be paying it through AMBAG. There's so much bad stuff going on, uh, the harmonization that goes on, and the insistence that people like your city manager or anybody else you appoint have a regional outlook and they're going to replace you by swarms of uh, agents uh, they say talk about in here and uh, they totally intend to get rid of local government. And as you know, if you've attended the California League of Cities, uh, which you see a picture of um, by uh, so-called Keeping California White by Mr. Phelan. If I can find that. Peace, uh, sorry folks. Uh, his campaign literature is Keep California White. This is the founder of the California League of Cities. Uh, he was self-financed because he's owned one of the large railroads as did Harriman and other people throughout the country. Uh, he was a member of Bohemian Grove, an occult secret society that has been talked about even in the House of Cards. They couldn't ignore it, but your uh, government schools do. They burn children in effigy. Anyway, I encourage you to end your membership or at least talk about it and retaining a direct election. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none. Uh, we will bring it back. Oh, where did my agenda go? Well, I'll use the paper one right in front of me. All right, we will bring it back now uh, to item... Oh, I'm sorry, item five, staff and city council comments. We'll start with staff. We have no comments this evening. All right, uh, we'll go to council comments. Any comments this evening? No comments? No, no comments? Okay. Uh, okay, I will just uh, give some brief comments that... Um, 
are ironically about AMBAG. So uh, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments uh, meeting this month uh, had a number of items on the agenda, carbon, and one of them was the Carbon Reduction Program Project Award Recommendations. Uh, and at that meeting, uh, the board voted uh, to fund the Capitola Community Center Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Project, um, which is really exciting. Um, and then also just within the region, uh, the Metro Transit, Di Metro Transit District uh, also received funding for uh, their 90X route between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. So two exciting um, funding um, allocations from, well, through AMBAG. Uh, and for the sake of, of sharing and for the sake of transparency, we also looked at the public draft Monterey Bay National and Natural and Working Lands Climate Mitigation and Resiliency Study. We looked at the draft 2026 Regional Growth Forecast Update, which is actually really exciting and interesting if anyone's interested in that. We looked at the AMBAG Complete Streets Policy and the draft 2425 Monterey Bay Region Overall Work Program OWP and budget. Many of these documents are required by state and federal law in order for local governments like ourselves to receive the funding that comes through the state and federal government. And that's, uh, that's my report. That's what I have to share. Okay, uh, we'll move on then if there's no further comments from staff. There's more comments from staff. Yes, hi. Just want to remind everyone that Skate Tola is this Saturday yes. from 11 to 4 at the McGregor State Skate Park. So we'll be setting up, I guess it's in just two days. So wonderful. On out. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I also just want to share briefly it was yesterday, but yesterday was National Peace Officer Memorial Day. And so it was a, a day to honor. Uh, all of our peace officers who have um, been injured or, or lost their lives in the line of duty. And so I just want to take a moment today to thank all of our uh, officers here at Capitola PD and all of the peace officers throughout uh, the region, the state, and the country who are working really hard to keep us safe. Okay, we're going to move right along to item six, general government and public hearings. It is the item of the evening, proposed fiscal year 24-25 budget. Jim. And Jamie, and or Jamie, Jim and Jamie. I'm just going to do a quick kickoff. This is obviously a big time of year for the finance department, the city, uh, as a whole. It's uh, it represents a lot of work preparing the budget. I know council appreciates that, but a lot of people put a lot of time into this, and a lot of those folks are sitting here in the front row, as well as Jim and some folks sitting in the back of the room as well. Put a lot of time into this as well. So, really appreciate everybody. Um, working together to help get the budget done. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim and get the presentation this evening. Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'll go over kind of a summary, review some assumptions, and then kind of get into some of the numbers. Next slide. Um, so our local economy is starting to show some signs of leveling off. Um, we actually saw after the COVID dip, we saw a pretty good increase, and, and now that's kind of leveling off. However, our property tax growth remains above average, um, and I think that's basically due to the high price of housing and as those houses are selling. Um, our proposed budget, you'll see that we have estimated $228,000 of revenues above expenditures on the ongoing side. However, um, we are still in the middle of um, ongoing labor negotiations, so I anticipate that number to change as, as those wrap up. Um, you'll see approximately a $1.2 million re, uh, expenditure reduction, and that's really due to last year, actually the last couple of years when we've had one-time funding go into specific projects, where this year we don't have that one-time funding. So that's really what's driving that decrease. Um, in the budget, there's $2.3 million program towards city council goals. That includes um, prior year goals that are still ongoing, some new stuff coming in the special revenue, fund, special revenue funds, as well as $239,000 new out of the um, general fund. Um, <clears throat> so our, our budget is structurally balanced. Um, we're estimating that June 30, I should say 2025, sorry, um, of next year will end at 727,000. Um, we also have $100,000 still set aside for the Employee Down Payment Assistance Program for a total of 827. Our target balance is generally 500, is where we try to make sure that we don't go below that. So this is kind of um, leaving a little bit of cushion in there for um, labor negotiations. So I anticipate that number will probably come down a little bit too once those wrap up. 
Uh, one of the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge I think that we have right now is our um, unfunded actuarial liability with CalPERS. We do have a reserve <laughs> fund set up with a balance of 1.5, which um, I want to say that reserve was set up in 2016 with the target to get to 1 million because that would cover one year's cost and we're at 1.5 and we're not covering one year's cost. Um, the, <clears throat> the UAL has increased. Last year, CalPERS was telling us that we had a UAL of 21 million that increased to 33 million this year, which caused our an annual payment to increase from 2.1 to 2.5 million. Um, that's important to note because last year at this time, they were telling us that our UAL was gonna stay flat through 2029 and then start to come down. And it's gonna stay flat right around $2 million a year and then start to come down after 2029 or 2030. Now that projection is showing it's going from 2.5 million next year to 3.5 million. So a lot of, it's, it makes it incredibly hard to forecast into the future when CalPERS is swinging like that. We expect that it will swing back. It's gonna take a couple of years, but it just, it makes the forecasting into the, into the future incredibly challenging. And, Calpers is telling you one thing and then it's swinging significantly the other way. Um, one of the things Jamie and I talk about a lot is our heavy reliance on sales tax and TOT. And um, I bring that up again because we have Measure F expiring in 2027. So when you see our forecast for future years, you'll see us balanced up until the expiration of 2027. And then our, our budget goes into an unstructurally balanced position. Um, reserve balances are slightly below the targets. Those move each year as our expenditures because they're a percent of expenditures. We have a lot of um, cash, if you will, that has gone into the wharf repair projects that we have not been reimbursed for. We're still working through getting those final numbers dialed in. And as those reimbursements come in, we bring those, the plan is to bring those reserves up to their targets. And then anything above that would return to the general fund. Next slide, please. So these are um, the forecasts or assumptions that we're using to, to forecast for the next five years. The ones that are up there on the top outlined in red are revenue assumptions. So you can see property tax, we have it 6% for a couple of years. Again, that's, that's higher than normal. It's typically around four, but it's the housing market's really driving that. Sales tax, um, those first two years are directly from our, our sales tax consultant. And then we have a 10 year average kind of going out after that. TOT, again, kind of leveling off, and then we expect room rates will probably pick up a little bit into the future, um, but holding pretty steady at around $2 million, a little over. Business license, we had a little bit um, uptick of, we had a lot that went out of business during the pandemic, and now we're seeing those return and so returning to a normal kind of growth pattern there. Building permits, we anticipate a um, significant increase this year, primarily because of two large projects that we have, the um, Midpen Apartments, I believe, and Dakota, or Midpen Housing, and then uh, Dakota Apartments that will be pulling permits. So we'll see an uptick in permit revenue. We'll also see some expenditures on the other side. We can get into that as I go through. Um, the cannabis business tax, I have it um, flat this year. It's kind of leveled out. One of We only have two shops. One's closed. We think another, we hope another is going to, fill in that void and, and kind of pick that growth back up. So we kind of have that one holding steady this year. Parking revenue up there, if you recall, uh, parking rates increased January 1st. So this is our first full fiscal year with the um, additional parking revenue. So that's why that's at 25%. Um, I'll note that you'll see zeros going out. When we did the parking rates, we set it up so that we could adjust by CPI, but we didn't think it was worthwhile to adjust like five or 10 cents a year. So we're kind of projecting when it would go to 225. It was probably about five or six years out. It would go from two to 225 and then sit there for a while. That's kind of how we're forecasting that. And then the last line up there is new uh, revenue from a hotel. We have a hotel um, in design planning phases right now. They seem to be pretty serious. Um, it looks promising, not quite promising enough to actually plug it in as the numbers, but we're showing it up there just to show it as something that we're tracking for um, TO, additional TOT revenue, potentially a couple of years out. Next slide, please. So this is just showing uh, total revenues over expenditures. And again, you'll see this year, um, we're about 228,000 with revenues over expenditures, drops a little bit next year. 
and then a little bit more in 27, and then measure F expires, and that's when it kind of flips the script a little bit there. Next slide. So this is our general fund summary, and <clears throat> you'll see um, revenues increasing by a little over 660,000. I'll break that down in a second. Expenditures, operating expenditures are going up. Overall expenditures are down. Again, the operating, um, and I'll, I'll get into is primarily personnel driven, since that's where most of our costs go. Um, and then the decrease is just down there, actually right by that fund balance number that you just don't see the um, transfers going out to the CIP and we're not buying as much equipment this year. We had some um, equipment purchases using one-time money last year. And that shows the um, 100,000 for the employee down payment assistance program and then the ending projected balance at this point. Again, probably will be impacted by labor negotiations. Next slide. So on revenue, uh, the drivers to get to the 661 is um, primarily property tax, sales tax, and the, the parking revenue, that's the 148 um, property tax, the 185, the sales tax between the Bradley Burns and the two districts is what, 192, and then the um, parking 148, and then everything else is kind of filling in. Permits or uh, building permits is driving that other revenue and franchise tax mostly. If you have any questions, please stop me. It's kind of going through these a little bit quick. Um, again, total general fund revenue is expected to increase 661,000. POT is holding pretty steady at about 2.1 million um, and re remains really strong in the village. We used to get a fairly small, not small, but much lower percentage of TOT out of the village. Now it's catching up to 41st Avenue, which is a good sign. Uh, sales tax, 44% and TOT, 21% of our total general fund revenues. The um, part that makes us nervous on that one is our top 25 sales tax generators are 70% of the total, and the top five are almost 40%. So those top, well, top 25, but especially those top five, if one of those goes out of business, that can really have an impact on us. Um, and we've had some top 25s drop off this past year, but we know that they're filling in for um, what, Bed Bath & Beyond, Michael's moved in there, Lucky's closed, but New Leaf is moving over. And, and so we're kind of just watching that whole little bin right there. But as those top generators kind of dip down, it, it puts us back a little bit. And then um, the village represents about 6.2% of the total. That's a little bit low from their normal. They're usually at about 8 to 9%. They were higher last year, and we think what that is is um, some of the sales on 41st Avenue dipped down, but sales remained strong in the village, and we think that's kind of flipped where they've picked back up in 41st, but the village seems a little bit slower this year. So um, just kind of throwing that up there. Property tax, again, 6% growth rate, and then what do I have for charges? Oh, the parking. Um, the parking rates are really driving the increase there. Next slide, please. This is just a um, graph of our uh, a pie chart for our breakdown of our revenues. So this is almost 79% comes from taxes, 12% from cargo flows, 91% of our revenues come from those two sources. And then I'll just show you how reliant we are on that. And then as far as taxes, um, property tax, a little over 21.5% is our most stable. But then the um, sales tax, which is Bradley Burns in the two district, as well as the TOT, tend to be the most volatile in the tax group, and that's 71%. We didn't experience it during the pandemic like we thought we would, um, but typically when you have those kind of mini recessions and stuff like that in town, they, they react really quickly. Next slide. And this is just, um, as you all are very well aware, we have a uh, Three quarters of a percent of our TOT going to local business groups and early childhood programs or, and youth programs. That's now up to about $74,000 for the local business groups split between the BIA and the chamber and about $65,000 going to um, the ECYP. I have a little bit of a breakdown on that in a few slides. Next slide, please. On the extent expenditure side, so I was talking about the personnel. Um, I'll tell you, these numbers are slightly different 
than what was in your packet. I had an error in my calculation on the reorg. So the numbers that are up there are actually correct and they'll be um, corrected in the next draft that you receive. So personnel is going up 843, that's driven um, by COLAs. Step increases, a big chunk, probably over half of that is just the CalPERS UAL. And then um, we're doing a reorganization within the Recreation Division. So that uh, total personnel is 843, that's 415 going to full-time employees, which includes the reorganization for recreation. Our salary for part-time and seasonals is increasing. I think that's a combination of um, more, more the bigger programs, a few more programs, and also an increase in the minimum wage. Um, overtime, we're showing a reduction of 92,000, and really that's really getting us back to our norm. Our overtime this past year was significantly higher due to the two um, murder investigations, the hit and run and the murder and, and the um, storm activity that we had in December of last year. Uh, specialty pay, 88,000. That's, um, that increase this year is driven by a number of employees kind of hitting their longevity and senior officer type pay is a little, probably about 60% of it. And the rest is we have many more bilingual speakers than we have had in the past. So that is um, getting bilingual pay basically to everybody that is bilingual and, and um, interacting with the um, community in different languages. And then benefits, the 381, that's CalPERS. It actually, some benefits came down. CalPERS was a little bit higher than that increase. Next slide, please. Um, this is expenditures by department, pretty typical for a city. You see almost half of the cost going into the police department and a little over 20% going to public works. We now have about 10% going to um, community services and recreation and combine it with art and cultural. And then there's uh, the other 25% or so. And then how those are broken out, again, personnel is our biggest driver. We're in the service industry, so that's always our largest cost. Um, and pretty standard for a city with, with a police department, but not a fire department. If it was higher, it might be a little higher because of the fire that we came across. Um, contract services, that's just the contracts that we have throughout all the city. And I, I will say the, probably 20 to 25% of that is the one contract that we have with the 911 JPA service. Um, for the construction as well as operations. Next slide. And then staffing, since we are a, um, our biggest cost goes to personnel, this is just kind of really showing that it's not because of more personnel. We're basically at the same level now as we were back in the year 2000. So we haven't had an increase in staffing over the last 24, 25 years. We've had reallocations of how the, they're assigned and work, but we still have the same number. Next slide. Is and then the just to wrap up the early childhood and youth program restricted funds. Uh, I mentioned that we have revenue estimated about 65,000. 60,000 of that is already programmed into the community grant program for early childhood and youth programs. This is the third year of the three year cycle. Uh, we have scholarships about 13,500 rolling over from recreation um, into this year that can still be used for scholarships. We have 8,600 program for youth enrichment programs, and that includes 1,300 for two, I believe, high school students to participate in the youth, with the Youth Action Network. <clears throat> and then that would leave us with an estimated ending fund balance of $5,000 in that restricted year. Good evening, Mayor Council members. Uh, we're here to talk about the Capital Improvement Program for 24 to 25. A lot of familiar projects this year, so I'll try to make it as quick as I can. Um, so the, um, the prior year appropriations, we still have 10 projects ongoing at a value of about $16.6 .6 million of funds secured, though other funds that we anticipate, such as uh, funds for the community center and the playground, so those aren't counting those funds. Um, only one new project this year, which is pavement management that we will talk about at length. 
And then this is not inclusive of some pending storm damage repairs left over from the storms of last year, uh, specifically the uh, ramp, next, Hooper's ramp next to the wharf, and then also the um, damages to the outfall of Noble Gulch into SoCal Creek. And then there are also two new council goals from this year of about $110,000 worth of projects that are not included as part of the capital improvements pro program because they are not really a high value project, though very time intensive projects. Next slide. Um, so completed projects from this past fiscal year, our generator up at the up in the parking lot, our Capitola Road rehabilitation and the Kennedy Drive sidewalk are all completely closed out. Um, also intended to be closed out at the end of this fiscal year, so by June 30 is the Bay Avenue and Hill Street quick build that's uh, currently out to bid. And then uh, eight projects have been closed out on our end and we're waiting to be closed out by FEMA from storm damage repairs from January of 2023. Next slide. Um, so priority projects are still open from prior year appropriations are obviously the wharf and then also under construction right now is RISPIN, which is expected to be completed next fiscal year uh, this October. Uh, the playground and community center uh, renovation projects, um, we are expected to start construction in the fall of this year for the community center and hopefully within the fiscal year of uh, the J Street playground, depending on the success of the fundraising efforts by County Park Friends. And then also in design currently is the Cliff Drive Resiliency Project, which will ultimately be uh, funded through a combination of FHWA funds and city match. But right now that $1.2 million value is a uh, for design and permitting. Next slide. Um, other projects that are still um, ongoing is the Stockton Bridge Protection Project. You may recall that uh, State Senator Laird uh, put some money towards that and so did the city. So that is currently in design and will be coming to council for consideration within the next calendar year. Uh, the Monterey Park pedestrian pathway, which is that uh, sidewalk coming out of the upper parking lot um, is currently out to bid. The corridor study for Bay Avenue is in design. Utility undergrounding is still pending with PG&E. Um, they are coming to the end of their Rule 28 program, which is what is funding this project. So we should have some kind of reconciliation with them by the end of the calendar year. And then Park Avenue traffic calming, which is in final design and will be here for consideration by council this summer. Next slide. So the only project we have new for this year is our pavement management program. Um, for approximately $621,000, those are restricted revenues from SB1 and Measure D. And I'm going to go into a little bit of a deep dive of uh, the description of this particular project. Next slide. Um, so for those of you who were not here when we did our last pavement management program overview, which is including myself, I was not here, but I'm very familiar with the process. Um, you all made a decision to move forward with a five-year pavement management program. So just very briefly, I'm gonna go over the steps that got us there. Uh, next slide. So pavement management, which is a very interesting topic in a whole career field, um, is very much based on pavement conditions. So the top uh, PCI 100 is the best. That's a brand new road. Uh, zero being the worst, which is a failed road, which this is 28, so zero is like dirt. <laughs> um, and so different roads deteriorate at different rates, considering if they're a collector or a residential road or a arterial like 41st Avenue, and they deteriorate in different ways, which is can make a very long conversation. But overall, what you get to is this green to red scale, 100 to zero, that kind of like gives you a sense of the type of condition your road is in. You really want to be in the yellow or above. <laughs> Next slide. Um, pavement deterioration is not a straight line. Um, it, when a road is new, you can repair it with very cheap and easy uh, methods, which is kind of the top of this, um, of this graph here on the top left. As you go down, you get to a steeper curve and it deteriorates very quickly, which you get to more expensive measures to, um, to repair a road. A brand new road, time-wise, um, if you did nothing to it, it lasts you 25 years, kind of regardless of the type of road it is. Um, and so the further out you wait to maintain the road, the more expensive it's going to be. Next slide. So there's different ways of doing pavement management strategies. 
Um, one method is to do your best first, which is you take your new roads and only maintain those. And if we were a city of only new roads, that would be the way to go, but we are not. <laughs> um, another method is to do the worst first, but if you're only doing your bad road, worst road maintenance, you're gonna spend all your money there, and then your good roads are gonna kind of come bad. So we kind of hit this like middle of the road critical point management where you want to kind of trade off of doing some of your good road in the light maintenance. So that's that left kind of circle there and then and catching it before you need to rehab them. And then also catching the roads where you can rehab them before they totally fail. So you try to do a combination of those where since we don't all, we have a mix of roads and also just kind of a mix of the status they're in and their underlying condition. When the city was incorporated, we acquired a bunch of roads from the county. They're also made for lack of, made in different ways. So they, they aren't all, rehabilitation is different for different types of roads. Next slide. So in June 2020, the city updated their pavement management program. So that involved evaluating all of the public streets and we found that we had a PCI 51, which was really hovering at that like critical point of failure, of potential maintenance versus failure. The city adopted a plan of this critical point management. So kind of switching off between working on good roads and like not failed roads. Um, we've decided to utilize the budget from SB1 to measure D restricted funding, not to say that the city doesn't acquire other funds from um, periodic grants and other allocations from the RTC, but the pavement management update only assumed the, fun the more um, predictable funds. And in that plan, it detailed a five-year plan of specific streets. And all that together kind of maintains the PCI in the city in the low to mid 50s. Next slide. So that all relates to this project because we are using the street segments from that program to for our 24-25 pavement management plan. It's generally uh, pavement maintenance this year. Last year, we did uh, Capitola Road, which is more of a rehabilitation project. That was a $2 million project. Um, and they are all the same streets that you all saw two years ago, less Cliff Drive, because we currently have a study out on Cliff Drive. Um, one of the um, big changes we want to make this year is to modify our bid cycle. So what we've been doing the past three or four fiscal years is waiting for our budget to pass. We bid the project. We bid it in summer you can't get it constructed until fall. And so we've had the past two years doing road projects when it's starting to get in the winter season, it's starting to rain, it delays the projects, they become more costly projects. It's really not a good way for us to be uh, bidding pavement projects. So to, del to have the budget pass in June and then to bid it in the winter allows us to do the sp spring and summer season construction it also, for this region, gets us better bid prices. I will say in other jurisdictions, um, where we're small like, the, like we are, you can bid in the summer and kind of get in between some of the contractors, other projects, and get good prices. That doesn't really work here because we have a smaller pool of contractors. So many, almost all of the contractors are completely bid out. And if we were to ask them to do the project in the summer, they give us high price because they're not doing a more profitable project somewhere else. Um, so with that recommendation, we would also recommend it, recommend spending some of our monies immediately this summer of 2004, and that is for some streets that are in that failure category. So that's uh, specifically on San Jose Avenue, and then also the corner of Raposa and 38, which will likely not last another winter without completely failing. And so rather than doing an emergency project in December, it'd be better to do a rehabilitation work this summer. Next slide. Uh, so for those of you who are interested, these are the lists of roads, but <laughs> very specifically the roads we plan on doing now uh, this coming spring, so spring of 2025. Like I said, these are all the same ones from 2022 Les Cliff Drive. That is our capital improvements this year. Um, just as uh, a reminder, some of the other uh, recently street projects we've completed um, over the past five fiscal years. Uh, include work on Park Avenue, on Brommer. Um, a lot of these were grant funded and supplement to our RTC and SB1 funding. I think this is still me. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we, oh. 
Um, so these were the goals that the council established in our March meeting when we were talking about what we were going to do this next year. Uh, we were, Jim and I presented the available funding and we pointed out the fact that we were really much more limited this year than we've been in prior years. And so the council put funding into, we carried over the funding for the employee down payment assistant, assistance uh, program. The lifeguard storage shed, you will recall, is failing and really needs to be fixed. Um, investing in the PD facilities, specifically the locker rooms. There's requirement in state law, I think we've discussed it before, around the um, visibility required around crosswalks, so removing parking. And so this is $10,000 to look at some other options and what we need to do there. And then we have a number of projects around employee engagement, better access to information, outreach for our elections, uh, improved translation services, some website updates, just a lot of things to try to help sort of the public interact with the city better. And then you recall we put some funding in for a portable stage for events that can be used on the wharf for events on the wharf this summer, as well as for events at the parks. And you recall we put $5,000 in to help maintain some of the public art uh, around town. So that was the total expenditure that came out of the council goals. There were other things that, that we're gonna touch on quickly that weren't general fund. This is just the general fund goals. So then I think the next slide will take you into a lot of the public works projects. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of these we just went over. So I'll briefly go over those that were are not capital projects, but also projects uh, that we are working on. Uh, so I believe the only one that we didn't cover here is the update of the climate action plan. Uh, the COE will be coming to you next council meeting to speak somewhat to this, but that is on our uh, work plan for fiscal year 24-25. Next slide. Um, other projects that don't come to the level of capital improvement projects, but are also projects on public work schedule is improvements to uh, the medians on lower 41st Avenue that's currently out to bid. Um, additional repairs on the Perry Street Bridge. Uh, those couple of FEMA projects that we spoke about before that are still outstanding. Um, and those other ones are also capital projects we've already discussed. Next slide. Do. Uh, another current project we have going on actually starting tomorrow is our complete street safety assessments. Uh, that's mostly focused on Monterey Avenue. Uh, the lifeguard storage equipment, as the city manager mentioned, and the PD facility improvements, and then also the uh, daylighting citywide are all public works projects associated with the council goals. Um, also outstanding are some of these smaller projects, including the Norval Gulch pipeline repairs, uh, based on an assessment we did last fiscal year, the uh, Park Avenue traffic, traffic calming, which will be grouped in with that pavement management program, is a lot of it is um, traffic or uh, pavement related, same similar scope, uh, good use to uh, bid at the same time. Our uh, 2025 pavement maintenance project, and then also the pump track renovation, which we have a bit more detail for you on the next slide. Um, we had discussed this during the council goals, so just kind of a little bit more information and clarification on the McGregor pump track. Um, so currently it's a dirt pump track that was constructed around 2016, and it requires a lot of maintenance because it is dirt rather than asphalt. It, um, rather than having reoccurring maintenance um, needs, we are proposing to do an asphalt pump track. Um, it's also an all-weather surface. Um, there is currently some funds that we have put towards that. It is not fully, uh, fully funded at this time. Next slide. It's about something else. Um, but that is definitely a priority project on Public Works Radar and seeking funding for. Um, excluded projects for Public Works that were either part of these uh, council goals from this year or previous fiscal years or up on the screen. Um, one we failed to mention was uh, reviewing parking around new developments. We have uh, several multi-unit developments um, that all include parking, but we recognize that the parking is going to be affected in those neighborhoods. So looking into potential improvements of parking near those uh, developments. Um, other projects that are, are outstanding, very important, but not on the work plan for this year is the Depot Hill uh, pathway encroachments a study of the village for sea rise and uh, circulation, improvements at Splenda Park, softball stores at Jade Street Park that we're hoping to address post-project of the community center and the uh, playground, 
and then a motor shed for the police department. I'm going to um, go ahead and go over the slides for the goals, both the ones that are included in the work plan as well as those were excluded for the other departments. All the department heads are here. If you have specific questions, I was just going to kind of go through these sort of quick just to kind of remind everybody what we have going on and, and kind of the things that are on hold. Next slide. <clears throat> so as far as uh, community development, the wharf revisioning plan during the goal setting, we had set that um, at $75,000 to be funded out of the general fund. We've moved that through budgeting out of the war fund. We realized we had enough resources there to be able to pull that revisioning plan out of that fund, which is what it's designed for. So that one's a change from the goal setting session. Um, the housing element is probably going to be completed hopefully by June 30. You never know. That's the state. Um, and then the others up there for, were the same ones from the goal setting the updating 41st Avenue visioning, creating housing rehab grant loan program code update for the housing element and creating a home buyer assistance program and all of those are funded out of special revenue funds the two three projects that we are not that are still up there as a high priority but not in the work plan are the city hall phase two um, during goal setting that one was put on hold for right now primarily due to um, funding and workload constraints the estimate on that is 67,000. The update on the tree ordinance was also put on hold as well as historical guidelines. Next slide. Uh, for the city manager's department, I don't think we have any changes from the last time we met with you. Um, the five-year strategic plan during goal setting, we um, deferred that until fall of this year. Employee contract negotiations is ongoing. Uh, citywide digital applications, 5,000 is in the budget. The um, UA Playground fundraising coordination is ongoing. Risk management and HR policy um, is in, but funded for, I think, Ambasia. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and the revenue tax measure polling, uh, we pretty, we've done the polling. Now it's the public information part um, that is funded in progress. Employee down payment assistance program, 100,000 we're rolling from last year. And then I think Jamie already kind of touched on these, the employee engagement, outreach, increased outreach and translation, and website updates. What I will say on the increased outreach, I think on one side we have 5,000, on this side we have 10,000. 10,000 is the correct number, so that'll be corrected in the next um, draft as well. And then the technology updates were funded out of the PEG fund, 15,000. A couple of excluded projects, um, the annexation and city city sphere study we've um, since received uh, that was deferred during goal setting we've received some additional money from LAFCO so I have a slide later and we'll get into that a little bit deeper and then the memorial plaque program apparently is um, not in this year's work plan but still keeping track of next slide for recreation so I believe these are the same. The pilot wrap wedding event um, is in the work plan. It's not a cost, it's just staff time. Not just staff time, but it's staff time. Equity swim and public equity outreach program, uh, $20,000. That comes from a special revenue fund. Um, implementation of the park use permit program. Purchase of the portable stage for events, Jamie mentioned. The lifeguard um, equipment. Oh, that one's grayed out. I'm sorry. So those bottom two are grayed out. So projects that we still have on the list, but um, we don't have in this year's work plan are the lifeguard equipment and the pickleball courts. Next slide, please. Um, as far as art and cultural, we have the, the public art maintenance on um, 41st Avenue that Jamie mentioned, $5,000. Banners for the village streetlights is getting funded from the public art fund. And I wanna say that was like 3,000. Um, SUSD Park Avenue Washburn student art project. We didn't, those should be completed by the end of this year. Maybe, maybe not, close, possibly. Um, oh, for fun, the 12, the art and cultural, the summer program, uh, 12 concerts, two movies, four art fairs, and plein air are all in there and funded. Um, and no change in public art projects at this point. Next slide, please. Police department. Um, the same four that we saw during goal setting, the 
lock cameras, electronic online police reporting, and e-citations are all funded out of the special revenue, the um, local law enforcement funding. And then they also have the high surf threshold response checklist, which is uh, something they're working on with this staff time, not um, money. So I'm going to pause for a second before we get into some of the key points and see if we have any questions before I move on to this. All right, questions? Anybody can send any questions. Councilmember Clark, Councilmember Morgan. No. Okay, Councilmember Peterson. No. Okay, I have a couple questions. Um, the. Uh, housing element code update was 65,000 in REAP 2.0 funding with the governor's May revise last week. Are we expecting any, are we expecting we're going to maintain that 65,000 or I know there were some cuts to the REAP program. So are we going to feel that? We received notice a while back that they were going to cut the REAP program by 50%. So the 65,000 is at 50%. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I, I saw on one of the slides, so there was the pavement management plan with 60, 621,000 in SB1 and Measure D funds, but then later it said 500,000 in external funding. Is that something different? It was on one of the slides. I think that that was just an inconsistency. The $600,000 figure is the actual accurate one. I think the $500,000 may have been a placeholder when we were doing the goal setting. And I might have been working quickly before the meeting, and I knew it was about five hundred thousand. Okay, the six twenty one is the total amount of the SB one and Measure D that's coming in. The five seventy one is what will be bid out in January because we're going to do the. We think it's going to be about fifty thousand dollars to do the work this summer. Right. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, and then with the SB one and Measure D funds, do are we not putting any? Is there no city city funding going into the pavement management plan this fiscal year? Not this fiscal year. Um, but that 621 will cover all the roads that you showed us on the map, that list of, of the ones that are, okay, awesome. All right, those are my only questions. Thank you. Um, so next I just want to go over some of the key, key things in there, and um, you can stop me if you have questions um, as we go through. So the, one of the first thing is the creation of the Community Services and Recreation Department currently operates as a division. Um, by converting from a division into a full-fledged department, it's going to um, establish sustainability in, in, in the department. It'll also delineate a clear chain of command. Um, it'll establish the director of the department, director of community services and recreation. We'll expand the roles of the recreation coordinators that are there, the three of the coordinators that are there. It centralizes art and cultural operations, and from a budgeting perspective, it's about um, a $69,000 cost for the reorganization. Question about that. We received some letters with some concerns, and I think there's just some misunderstanding of what's going to happen when we switch from how we're doing it now. Can you explain that a little bit better as to what the costs are going to be? So at this point, our best estimate of the cost is about seventy thousand dollars. the The way we're set up right now, the recreation division is in the city manager's department. So what that means is that. I'm overseeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, which from a realistic standpoint, having been in this seat for a long time, is not really possible. You know, we're caring for thousands of kids a year. We have operations throughout the city where we're taking care of kids in senior classes. We have so many different kinds of programs. And in addition, we've been expanding a lot of the recreation uh, division's offerings over the last couple of years. You know, we've got the after-school programs. We've got the over art and cultural commission activities that's all been folded in so there's just so much more has grown in there and from a when Jim mentioned sustainability imagining that we would be able to continue to operate like this sort of risk-free um, I don't think it's really sustainable like in the long term this this operation the scale of this operation and as you saw we're almost at nine percent of the um, general fund really it really has sort of grown into a department at this point. I think maybe like people are kind of having sort of like sticker shock when they're looking at that. So I think maybe Councilmember Clark was saying like, where where is that 70K? 
going? Is that just a salaries? Is that, or are we? That is, that, out? that is primarily, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, that's okay. Thanks. That is primarily um, changes in sort of job descriptions for staff over there um, to help them stand alone as an independent department. Um, you know, I, I, I will point out that in a lot of, in most of our budgets, we make adjustments. Uh, last year's budget, you may recall, we added a, a cap, second captain in the police department. Um, we have added positions in public works in recent years. So this is an opportunity for us to make the adjustments. I know that people are pretty sensitive about it right now because we are in the middle of negotiations. Um, it's been something that we have talked internally about, particularly you know, Nikki and I looking at sort of the span of control and what's, what's an acceptable level of risk for quite some time. Um, so I understand the concerns people have raised. I think everyone just needs to understand it's, it's you know, not a zero sum game. And if at the end of the day, we can establish a more sustainable, lower risk city, um, that's in everyone's best interest. And I know the council does have a long-term plan. Um, we've talked about that half cent tax measure trying to go in November. And that really does a lot to solidify our long-term long uh, fiscal sustainability. Uh, a question on that same, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Clark, were you gonna say something? A question in that same um, idea, same concept. Um, we had a recreation department strategic plan and this was part of the strategic plan was eventually making it its own department, right? So I will defer to Nikki on that question. If you want to, there's other parts of the question. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll get to it. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, so as a part of the evaluation of the strategic plan was taking a look at the um, organizational chart of the division and recognizing that the way that it was organized um, was not the most efficient or effective for the overall business of the division. And so um, if you look at the strategic plan, it specifically calls out that to evaluate um, the organizational structure and identify opportunities for making that a more efficient and effective system. Great, thank you. I guess what I was getting at is that, um, I guess it's just a unfortunate um, timing situation that it happens to be happening now, but that it's not something that was just decided now, like all of a sudden we're gonna make this a department. This was part of a longer strategic planning process for the recreation department happening to come to fruition at this time, um, I think is what I'm trying to get confirmation of. Right? That is a fair characterization. You know, we have been moving um, responsibilities into the division for multiple years now. You recall that we moved the first full year of operations of our lifeguards. That's a new operation within the division that took place this last summer. I think the year before that, the Art and Cultural Commission um, was moved underneath the division. So there's been these multiple kind of moves over time. And so you're right, yes, it has kind of been moving towards this over a period of time. You know, the, the timing is unfortunate. The timing is a challenge for sure. I recognize that. Lafco, Lafco Sphere of Influence study, uh, 30,000 funded last year in this current fiscal year, which was postponed until fall of 2024. Um, since goal setting, we've received $15,000 from Lafco to assist us in moving that project forward. And then the other piece was, um, we also, the other project that we deferred was the long range, long range strategic planning project. So now with this additional funding from Lafco, we're thinking that these other projects deferred that we could actually bring this one back in and take advantage of the funding from that to move that project forward. One other detail for those of you that don't recall this, 
OFCO is required to complete what's called a municipal service review every five years for the various jurisdictions, all the jurisdictions in the county. And so in our last MSR review, this was kind of a, a deliverable we had to give them for the next one. We basically said, boy, Capitola, you have a big sphere. You go all the way out there past 41st and Opal Crest. Is that really the right sphere of influence for the city? And do you plan on an annexation? So they asked that question and said, we'd like you to do this study before the next MSR. Um, so it's not due next year. It is something that we have a couple of years to work on. But it's one of those things that I think um, we all are thinking about it now. And we do have some funding set aside for it. So it's one thing we could consider moving in the next year. So what exactly do we need to have by the next MSR? And when is that due? Is it just this study, or do we need to like decide if we what our intentions are? It is just this study. Chloe can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the requirement was complete in it, a sphere of influence study, which basically looks at the sphere and says, is this still realistically part of the city's long term plan? Mm -hmm. And is this forty five thousand dollars to cover that study, or is additional funding required? We have not issued an RFP. Um, our hope is that yes, that this would cover it. Uh, if it didn't, then we might have some difficult decisions to make. Uh, I have never done this before, so this would be a little bit of a new process for us. Uh, the executive director of LAFCO has offered to help assist us, and I think he has sample RFPs for us to use and has helped other jurisdictions do this sort of thing. Okay, so we plan to accomplish this study this coming fiscal year. That's it. what to council's discretion you know there's there's the bandwidth in the city manager's office is not huge it's not infinite <laughs> um basically it's chloe and i that would be working on this and so with the deferred uh strategic plan that gave us a little bit more breathing room um hopefully with the successful conclusion of the um negotiations and then the ballot measure placed on the ballot come the summer uh, there could be some room to do that if that's where the council chooses to kind of put your put your emphasis. Thank you. Did you did I keep going? You at least sure. Okay. So then the McGregor pump track director Khan talked about the advantages of an asphalt pump track. Costs about eighty thousand um, dollars. We have private donations at this point secured. 50,000. Um, we are seeking additional funds and we do have some potential leads. Um, if the council wanted to throw a couple bucks at it, we heard from some members of the community about how it was important. That would certainly, would certainly help. But right now we're talking to private donors and the goal would be if the council is on board, try to seek the funding to be able to get that done. We also have um, some, some of our local contractors have agreed to potentially donate or at cost some of the materials. So it's a pretty pretty good little project. And, and realistically, the, the all-weather component is important for those of you who've ever been out there. It's, it can be pretty muddy. Uh, and then phase two of the city hall needs assessment, you'll recall we just got the presentation on phase one. Phase two was kind of like taking it that next step, saying, okay, now we know what the problem is. What do we do about it? We didn't put 67K into it this next year. Um, and when we got the phase one report, council said, well, let's look at that and talk about it in the budget. Um, and that was both the funding constraints as well as kind of the workload in, in community development. So we could look at some of the other projects in community development and think about where this stacks up. I think there's two real ways to think about this. On the one hand, I think the consultant gave us a price tag of around 20 million for this, which is daunting to say the least. Nevertheless, um, you never, you know, you never you never cross the Rubicon without taking the first stroke. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the right. <laughs> is the Rubicon a river or is it a mountain? It's Step. Right. It's a river. So, yeah, it would be a stroke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and identifying what our plan is. I, I guess I'll put it this way. Understanding what the plan is would be really beneficial in a lot of ways. There are decisions that we have to make on a, I don't know, weekly, monthly basis. Jessica, I'm looking at you, <laughs> about, you know, like something is failing. And do you buy the 
cheap fix or do you buy the long-term fix? You know, and it's like, it's much easier to know that we're going to invest in a facility if this is where it is, or if no, this is going to be part of a five-year patch, you know, to get us to somewhere else. So I'm torn on this one. It's, it's hard to imagine the 20 million, but you don't know, you know, we, it's hard to imagine that we would have completed the wharf project and yet here we are. Um, so, and then is that the next slide. Uh, the pavement management, this was the, 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 the description that Director Khan described and exactly as Director Malberg said, the 621 and special revenues, and then this proposal to do some kind of basically emergency, not emergency, near-term repairs before the winter rains again to a few key spots around town and then bid the remaining project in the winter, hopefully getting better pricing, resolving weather issues. Um, so that's kind of another discussion point. It, it means that we don't do projects, you know, in the fall where people have kind of gotten used to seeing projects in fall, but I think in the long term, it'd be better for everybody to get used to seeing spring projects. And then the last item is at the fact, there was a question about the addiction defense collaborative resolution. And um, this is something staff is not familiar with. And so Council is interested in learning more. Staff could do some follow up with other jurisdictions, whether we could use special revenue for this. Um, don't have a lot of information about that right now, but I can talk with you may have gotten more about that some other report. I think that includes kind of the items for feedback. Yeah. So with that, we're ready to answer any questions. And the goal tonight is to identify any questions you might have, um, things you'd like us to provide more information about in our next presentation, which is scheduled for May 30th. And then kind of those key points, kind of we outlined there at the end, if there's any feedback, that would be helpful. With that, I'll start with the questions. All right, thank you. Councilmember Clark. I would be really interested to see how we get our PCI up. Um, it looks like we're not in a good position. Uh, with all the other projects we're, we're finishing and, and, and uh, getting a lot of things completed, I think we should really uh, focus on, on that part of it. Bring it up. Yeah, PCI is tough. It's just, it's money. You know, I think that presentation we got from the, from the engineer that did the streets analysis was like two million a year we needed to spend to bring our PCI up. It was, it was a staggering amount of money. So I we, think- We know that the, the construction costs are gonna continue to go up too. So that's that's also another factor. So I think that should be uh, one of our big focuses. Well, and on top of that, the longer you wait, the more expensive they get. You know, Director Khan went over this when the conversation about pavement. I mean, in an ideal world, what we would do is we would go out and we would borrow $30 million tomorrow and we would fix every single street, and then moving forward our five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 a year that we get in restricted road funds would take care of every road, and our roads would be great. Like, that's a sustainable plan. The trick is, is that initial massive investment. And for unfortunate reasons, you know, projects like community centers and wharves can bring in stabilizing Cliff Drive. Those things can bring in a lot of money from outside the city, as we've seen. General pavement just is not one that, you know, people in D.C. want to write big checks to do ribbon cutting for. So it's a challenge. It's something that's kind of on us. You know, we got to, if we're going to do it, we're going to have to find sources of revenue here. So if we do sort of the proposed Pavement plan um, is that that's not going to really affect our our rating at all, or is that going to help bring us up to a better level? Or so the adopted five year plan using the month, assuming that we only have funds for Measure D and SB one, keep us at the same okay. overall PCI. Oh, okay. Five years. Okay. So still at that like low to mid fifties. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, we go back to that last slide um, about the sort of the things for feedback. Sorry. <laughs> um, it was actually. The it was, yeah, one more back. Sorry. Right. 
Yeah, that one and the one before, the one before that. Those were kind of the okay. key points. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm really interested to see what we can do about the pump track. Um, I see that it's a kind of a big ticket item, but I think if we are getting close with some donated funds, um, maybe we can explore that a little bit. Um, and that way, it's just more user friendly for the youth. Um, and then, could you refresh my memory on what sort of the, the benefit of doing this LAFCO study um, would be, like annexation and all that, like uh, not to go like way into the weeds, but um, just if we're going to put that money into it. Yeah. So the way cities work is, is you have your city limits, and then you have like your sphere of influence. And the sphere of influence is intended to be places that the city is intending to annex at some point. Um, annexations around basically sort of the capital of Live Oak and Santa Cruz area essentially stopped, I think, in the 1980s. So like the last big ones were around the Capitol Mall. Everybody sued each other and like everything froze. And there was a time when there was kind of a vision that like Capitol and Santa Cruz were going to meet up around 17th Ave or something. Um, and that stopped. And so we have this sphere that extends pretty far out to the west. And the La LAFCO has just come to us and said, does it still make sense? Now, the argument for considering annexations is that we can plan for and provide services more efficiently, potentially, to those communities because we're here. Police department's here. Our public works department is here. Um, it also gives us more opportunities for economic development. But the rules around annexations have also changed. Back in the day when we annexed the mall, it was pretty easy to just sort of you grab the land and you built a mall on it and you made a bunch of money. Um, today, there's revenue neutrality requirements that you have to make sure like how you're going to pay for the services. So, you know, it it's a complicated, it would be a very complicated project. I've heard a lot of people sort of say, oh, it doesn't, it makes sense, like that all 41st should be in Capitola. And I think logically there's a pretty good argument for it. Um, we would be investing $30,000 of our general fund in doing it. And I can imagine there's advantages to it, but it's also like, it's a pretty heavy lift. At the end of the day, just so you know, I think it takes a vote of all the affected people as well as all the residents of the city looking at our staff, yeah. So it's like it's a whole lot. It, it's a complicated process. So those are kind of the pros and cons. Um, and yeah, and LAFCO asked us to do it. We don't have to. If we don't, they might just say, okay, well, if you're not really that interested, maybe we'll just shrink your, shrink your sphere to the city limits, which I don't know that that would be the end of the world. You've lived this way since 1980. In our county, Watsonville has been highly successful. With LAFCO, it might be interesting to look what they have done over the years because their city has has grown quite a bit. Yeah, and and the difference is that they're growing onto um, undeveloped land. I can imagine if we had a ten acre parcel next to town, you know, we'd be looking at that and imagining economic development opportunities, affordable housing opportunities, great parks, city halls, all kinds of things. We had an area similar to the Forty First Avenue of Freedom Boulevard. So quite a few places on Freedom Boulevard weren't in the city, kind of like on both sides of the street. So they just pretty much filled all of Freedom Boulevard in into the into the county. It'd be interesting to see how how they did it and if they had anything to to tell us on the on the good and the bad of it. Can I chime in on this. Yeah, isn't I mean the whole point of the study is to kind of suss out the feasibility and if it makes sense for both parties, right? Uh, yeah, we won't really know that until we, you know, invest into looking at that. But I, yeah, I'll leave it there. That is, that is, it's really kind of digging in deeper, looking at the economics, doing some outreach, finding out, maybe doing some polling. I'm not sure all the different components to it, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I would definitely. Well, is this this is a questions, non comments? Yeah, okay, just questions. Um, do so. We expect 
that there may be additional funding and the fifty thousand dollars is is indeed committed from somebody do we know who got the private information mark money said he's good for 50 on it um, that's that's amazing yeah yeah he's written a check for 30 already he says count me in for another 20. um he said let me see let me see about trying to trying to get the rest of the funding so he has he's been true to his word in the past and has funded some really amazing projects you know by the community the children's room at the library the tennis courts the skate park there at mcgregor so um yeah it's a verbal commitment and i have no reason not to believe it and he is he said he's gonna gonna shake rattles shake some trees to try to get get more money to try to make this thing happen very cool um and regarding the pavement management the fifty thousand dollars um that would need to be spent this calendar year right that's what that was yeah is that coming from the general fund or is that coming from those two dedicated funding sources the restricted funds yeah that's coming from restricted funds okay and then i just had another kind of more general question about the pavement management um because the two restricted funding sources are set to keep us at what would like level 50 or i forget what the terminology was for that throughout the next five years not great but don't we get other funding sources like from the rtc and times for like from other sources wouldn't that you know if we're maintaining the source and other funding comes in wouldn't that gradually bring it up levels yeah Yes, so we do, for example, some of the funding for Capitola Road came from one of the RTC, uh, our TIP grants this past year. The, a couple of years out, we have money from the RTC to do some work on 41st Avenue. So yes, it does bring up the PCI somewhat, but those are very small increments. So it wouldn't be getting us to like a 70 or 75. It would be the difference between like 52 and 55. Like it really to get up to like a, 70 level would be like something like 15 million dollars at one time like it really is yeah expensive <laughs> i think i think that's all my questions for now thank you all right uh seeing no further council questions we'll go to public comment on this item <coughs> seeing no public comment on this item we'll bring it back to council uh for discussion and discussion because there's no vote tonight. Any further comments or questions? Yeah. I feel like I always start on this end, Joe, and you ended sure. up last, I appreciate so I'm, that. I'm starting. Um, yeah, I just want to say it's that's a lot of information. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, the staff does a great job of putting this all together. Um, we could probably talk about it pretty much the whole night long, but uh, it, good to see we're still moving forward. Still want to see the 51% go up a little bit, but we're, we're doing a lot of good things and thanks for all the hard work to the staff. Okay. <laughs> Comment slash question. Yep. Uh, any further comments? Yeah. Um, so we, I, I think one of the things, so first of all, the sphere of influence, I would be in favor of pursuing that. I think it's worthwhile. I think we already got additional funding from LAFCO. Um, I would also be interested in hearing more about the Eviction Defense Fund, um, learning more about that. And then for the phase two of this city hall, um, it sounds like we're being asked if we wanted to reallocate funding from elsewhere or what is what was staff's intention with that this was on because at the hearing when we got the phase one report council asked and said what are we doing with phase two we reminded the council that hey it's on the grayed out spot mm -hmm. and everyone said well let's take a look at that in the budget so that's that's why it's there um Basically, we would need to pull $67,000 from elsewhere to make that happen. 
Yeah, I mean, there's both the staffing, the staffing associated with it, as well as the funding. Um, you know, the the facilities fund does have resources in it, so that is an option. Um, doesn't hit the bottom line in terms of fund balance. The so question just comes down to sort of would we potentially pull something off of the community development department plate if we were to do that, if that was a council priority, and we could take a look at what those projects might look like. So you're more concerned with the staff time then, is what I'm hearing. I think I think that that's probably true. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the question about City Hall is a really hard one, right? And so it's like the last thing I think I want to do as a city manager is suggest that like we spend $67,000 on a project that we don't ever think we're ever going to do. Um, that being said, to the point that I made earlier, it's like there are decisions being made like every couple weeks around here about like, do you buy that like top of the line garbage disposal or do you just fix it, you know? So like it's, it's hard. And so coming to the point of like, this is our plan gives us a little bit of a North Star. So there's value in that. Um, but I think it would also be good to hear that the council says, you know, that is, yes, there's value in that. And, you know, that would be something we would like to put some work into. And it's going to be controversial. You know, it's like some people will throw rocks at us about whatever decisions we make. So, you know, I want to go into it with our eyes open if we do. And then I think taking a look at where the community development department's kind of work plan is. And I think, you know, there might be something we could talk about shifting around if everybody's like, this is something we got to do. I think it definitely makes sense to come up with a plan, whatever that is, because like you said, like what are we doing short term fixes or long term fixes in the meantime kind of thing? And like what are we what are we gearing up towards? Are we gonna be here for, you know, fifty years or for ten years or just to have those kind of answered, I, I think have those questions answered will save us money and headache in the long term and would be worth pursuing if there is time. I know we have a lot of important projects. To do, but maybe the I mean the grayed out um, projects are possible to come back. Yeah, we could also take a look at what the community development department projects are. We could hear from Director Hurley a little bit. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you. So I think um, going through the end of this year. Through 2024, we're really focused on our housing element implementation. Um, I'll be bringing a contract to you at the next hearing, next meeting. We're also focused on the wharf and the future plan there. Um, and then our day to day projects. I do think it would be reasonable to be able to jump into the city hall plan probably in January of next year once we've gotten past. We just have some really uh, big commitments this year, but. So I don't know if it's a mid-year, if you want to relook at it at mid-year, or if you wanted to fund it now and, and just realize that it's probably a, will become active in January. Um, it's a lot of public outreach and discussion, and we're going to be doing a lot of public outreach and discussion um, with the WARF project. And also we're funded for the 40, 41st Avenue Economic Development Study as well this coming year. So there's like kind of three big projects happening, but I do think this is very important as well. So we could either relook at it at mid-year or just have that understanding that it would be 2025 when we would kick it off. I almost feel like this might make sense to try to do some public outreach with the board. Like, I don't know. I think it's, so I think the, basic structure because we have a scope of work for phase two and I think the basic structure was kind of first doing a little bit of like um, establishing goals mm -hmm. like what are, what are we trying to do with the new city hall you know and and then once you kind of have gotten some feedback about those goals then starting to evaluate the options and then evaluate the options against the goals so kind of the first step I think is a little bit of that outreach but it's kind of part of the overall scope. So would it be advisable to, I guess we could either allocate funding now or allocate funding later, but it sounds like you may have time later in the year. Yes. It, the, the, the time it would, when we would focus on this would be in like January of next year. 
would be reasonable unless you wanted us to hold off on the like economic development study but, you I know, know just no, I, I think that's really important especially you know looking at our and your financial outlook I think economic development is one of the smartest things we can do right now I like the idea of January to take a look at it then too yeah same um Julie will you pull up the um I think it was labeled as like key key points or takeaways from the slides I just want to make sure that yeah the, those three slides at the end can you go a little closer to the mic yeah sorry yeah um okay and I think I touched on all of those and then the paving measurement yeah okay that, that brings me to the end thank you just want to make sure I didn't forget anything all right uh, I will just say thank you to the staff for all your hard work and every time we do a Yes. I just get one clarification. So when you say January, do you want us to fund it now with the idea or bring it back at mid year? Okay, perfect. Yeah. I mean I mean mid year really is February. February, March. Maybe we'll plan on bring it back in January, see where we're at. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to thank the staff for all your hard work. Every time we do a budget and I see how much we've accomplished with how much we have in resources it's, um, really impressive and I know that you all work really really hard um, so thank you I want to um, acknowledge the uh, 50,000 going to the crucial route roads this year I think is really important and, and I appreciate that as well um, the eviction defense fund was something that I was approached about and it was my request um, that we look into it it is a different need than we have funded typically within the county um, in terms of addressing homelessness and housing. Typically we are addressing uh, eviction prevention or housing assistance or rental assistance. This is an entirely different need and that is funding legal, def uh, legal defense services for people who are at risk of being evicted for um, mm -hmm. unlawful reasons. And so I think that that's another important way of addressing the housing and homelessness issue is by preventing people from becoming displaced in the first place. Um, and so I, I agree with staff. I think learning more about it. My understanding is that this is a collaborative of nonprofits in the area, but I am completely open to getting more information before we allocate funds to it. But I do appreciate that it's been brought forward um, and that we're looking into it because I think it would be um, worthwhile for us to, to be a part of it. My understanding is that the other cities in the county um, are also being asked to contribute to this. And so if that's the case, I think it's important that we come to the table and be a part of um, addressing the issue as a, as a region. Um, and then uh, also I'll just acknowledge and appreciate uh, the 1300 for the Youth Action Network within the Early Childhood and Youth Programming. I know that's something that Vice Mayor Brooks um, had a, uh, was, was important to her and she can't be here today, but I, I just want to acknowledge that um, as well. And um, that'll be all of my comments. All right, with that, uh, we will come to the end of our meeting and we will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting on May 23rd at 6 p.m. Until then, take care of yourselves and take care of each other and this meeting is adjourned.